Damien. Yes, hi. Are you married? Uh, no, but I pretend to be married. <laughs> it actually, my, my strategy is that if I'm taken, they'll come to me. <laughs> I know, right? it's ter a terrible strategy. It appears to work because people are more interested in someone that's uh, unavailable. That's in my experience. Ah, uh, that's a big one. That's a good question. Um, love, I actually found, I heard and someone else uh, say a definition of love is, is when you serve the other person. Um, well, love means a lot of things for me. Maybe the main thing means security. Love is a connection between two human beings who can be their full selves and support each other to be the best versions of themselves in union. Actually, I do know this answer. Love means to me the feeling of um, coming back home to something where you just feel that it's so right and it feels like home. When you think of love and romance, we have many different cultural icons that come to mind. Passionate kisses in the rain, like from The Notebook, sexual lust and desire, mysterious and fleeting connections. But today, millennials partake in a version of love and relationships far different from that of their forefathers, one mired in freedom, novelty, and carnal desire. Great cultural shifts like the decline of religion, the sexual revolution, the rise of feminism and liberalism have thrown romance into a new, confusing age. A large portion of our population focus on obvious positives of these changes, such as the liberalization of divorce laws that have led to huge reductions in the rate of domestic abuse. It's undeniable that some change needed to occur, However, there's a growing sentiment that we may have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. And in the wake of the sexual revolution and liberalization, the dream of the white picket fenced family is slowly fading away to an impossibility only preserved in Norman Rockwell paintings. The lack of stringent rules keeping people together has opened a different Pandora's box of its own a brave new world in which many no longer know what the vision of their future romantically and family-wise holds, and younger generations are utterly addicted to trying to solve this crisis. If you pull up any tweet, podcast clip, or YouTube video essay from a guy or gal who's telling you how to live your life these days, all you'll get is thousands of different pieces of completely contradictory advice. Here are things you should never say to a woman, ever. Ladies, pay attention. So this is basically the way that men decide how much they value you. In many cases, these men and women preaching their wares to the world end up focusing on the most hardcore examples of detestable behavior perpetuated by the opposite sex, that doesn't really translate to reality. Women are more manipulative than men. The average Zoomer is being drip-fed a constant warped reality that's leading to greater intersex resentment and a hell of a lot less love. Girls, how much money should a guy make per year? Like a million. Would you ever marry a guy who makes less money than you? How much less? However, before we can discuss the crisis caused by the sexual revolution, first we must understand why it came about in the first place. The sexual revolution has changed for the better most people's sexual lives. I mean, when I started off as a sex therapist back in the 70s, people were so embarrassed to talk about sex. Uh, they often had aspects of sex that had caused them enormous anxiety all their lives and they'd never been able to tell anybody. Whether it was the shape of their penis or whether it was some sort of sexual desire or some sort of, you know, whatever it was, they had no one to tell and it was a whole 
area of their lives that was full of shame and embarrassment. And that was the great privilege of my life as a young woman, to be the person that everybody told about their deepest fears and the, their yearnings and what they didn't know, and, and to teach people about their bodies and to give them answers. And I mean, I remember I was sitting in my office one day and I got a call from a, a nurse at one of our big hospitals. She said, I've got a ward full of young men who've had spinal injuries and they're all asking me, will they ever get an erection again? And what do I tell them? None of the doctors will talk to them. And I went to America and said, and found out who was doing work, the first work on spinal injuries and erections, finding the people who are beginning to get the answers to what was, you know, will that man ever get an erection again? Um, I mean, there, were, there was issue after issue like that, where the whole discussion around sexuality had been totally taboo, and gr the sexual revolution opened those doors and improved the lives of millions of people across the world. Problems around sex have always existed, but they haven't always been discussed. Whether it be sexual deprivation, erectile dysfunction, STDs, body insecurity, miscarriages, or infertility. The world needed to open up to having these conversations publicly instead of making them a taboo. The sexual revolution provided a space to do that by breaking away barriers and customs which kept us silent about our sex lives. However, as with any cultural revolution, there are always trade-offs. And while many barriers needed to be broken, others torn down may have proved necessary guardrails for healthy human interaction. It's very difficult to pull apart what is the damage caused by the sexual revolution from the other societal changes that were cha you know, to do with our attitudes towards marriage, to do with so much has changed in our society. And I think teasing out how much of that is to do with our attitudes to sex is very difficult. It's just too complex an equation. I've heard the term sexual revolution ever since I was a first year psychology student. And actually there has not been one sexual revolution, there have been several. Right? In one hand, you could say that there's been a sexual revolution with the advent of the birth control pill. But women had sexual revolution. Nowadays, you can say there's been a sexual revolution with people that are openly gay or have openly other sexual preferences. Uh, so there's been a widening of perspective and an inclusive mindset in society at large. So of what's been acceptable as far as sexual preferences or expressions of those. Has that been good? Yes, I think with every um, cultural shift, there are pros and there are also cons. If people not just express sexuality, but also express a willingness to convey responsibility, a sense of perspective and realism, in other words, you're not just expressing fantasy or a facade, but you're also trying to showcase what goes beyond just sex what goes just beyond sexual expression? Because again, sex doesn't happen in a vacuum. Even if people think it does, it doesn't. Sex is always connected to psychological processes, neurological processes that lead to emotion and a deeper sense of attachment. So people are kidding themselves if they're only thinking sexual revolution is about accepting one's sexual expression and preferences. It should always lead to a conversation about relationships what goes into relationships, what defines healthy relationships, and most importantly, what defines healthy relationships over time. Because what starts a relationship, what keeps it exciting, is not what keeps it together over the long term. So what actually defines a healthy relationship? Outside of rejecting an abusive one, it seems we aren't really broaching this question anymore, at least not in a meaningful way. The major problems, I think, exist with online relationship advice today, and this can be boiled down maybe simply, is you have a lot of people that just make things up because it feels right to them. Stop dating only one girl at a time. We don't like to have fun and hang out with girls. We like to sleep with girls. They don't really look at uh, what we know empirically about what makes relationships function well. 
what makes them function poorly, and you have a lot of ideology that filters into this. Men care about looks and personality, and women care less about looks and more about I don't know how to draw the universe, so I drew a galaxy. Folk psychology or pop psychology, things people popularly believe that sometimes are right, but very often are wrong as well. You have a lot of trends that are kind of ideological that filter into what I like to call like TikTok therapy, right? Kind of beliefs that people have about how human psychology should be, or even how they think a therapist should act in this context, but really is very often divorced from the way that uh, actual trained psychologists perceive it. Specifically, what we see uh, within Manosphere red pill subcultures is kind of this appropriation of evolutionary psychology as well, almost turning it into like a character. And so people take what are essentially average differences or trends between groups and they apply it to everyone. For example, the idea in the Manosphere of, of uh, all women are like that, right? They call it AWALT. Every single woman, for example, is capable of cucking a man, cheating, or lying or being deceptive. Uh, do I believe that not all women are like that? No, I don't. And you know, this is something that is basically the opposite of what you would learn studying evolutionary psychology or, or personality psychology, where there are individual differences and you know, not all men are the same. Not all women are the same. You can use sociosexuality as an example that uh, you know, some people are very high in this, very promiscuous, many people are not at the same time. As a result of growing advice on the internet sphere that presents itself as intellectual and even data-driven, but is often divorced from reality, many have observed a growing gender war occurring. We see, you know, evidently in modern society that there's kind of a, a gender war, a battle of the sexes, right? And, you know, the term battle of the sexes goes back decades. There's always been some extent of hostility from men towards women, and often this is related kind of to frustrated mating. Within the research, that's kind of what's seen, is that misogynistic attitudes grow when men feel that they are excluded from mating, essentially, when they're excluded from the dating pool. And we can see this, for example, in the rise of the incel community. There's been a couple of interesting studies that tracked users from earlier uh, communities, like pickup artists, right, where they try to teach people how to form relationships. And a lot of people have left those communities they've actually moved into the incel communities. So these have grown. So that's an idea that, uh, you know, or an indication that there is kind of this growing resentment. I think there's a very strong saliency of anecdotes online through like TikTok, Instagram reels, that sort of a thing. So people see a lot of negative behavior online that's not representative. And then that further fuels their uh, perception. And a head full of anecdotes kind of making it seem like everyone is terrible in the opposite sex. And I guess the only thing to consider about that, you know, as far as this bitterness, is it justified? You know, people will say, yes, no, I'm gonna tell you no. But one thing is for sure, if you're bitter toward the opposite sex, if you hate the entire opposite sex, it will destroy your relationships. You will have a really hard time forming new relationships, romantic relationships, any relationship you're in, it's going to be really destructive for you and for the other person. You can't hate the whole opposite sex and have a loving relationship at the same time. This divide has created an ever-growing sense of loneliness and sexlessness amongst younger generations. A loneliness, however, that has been felt since the dawn of time in those lacking touch or romance. And many turn to other methods beyond traditional love to satisfy said emptiness. Sex work is the oldest profession in the world, with Sumerian records going back to 2400 BCE of prostitutes' existence. The numbers of men who pay for sex vary from 16% in the United States to 40% in Spain, and studies have shown their reasoning varies greatly as well. Large portions of men have pure sexual urges, while well, other reasons may surprise you, like desperation for some sort of emotional intimacy and social connectedness. I was um, changing careers and I answered an ad for a reception position. It didn't say what the business was. I was a little bit anti-sex work before I joined the industry. And then I yeah, went to this job interview and it turned out I was in a massage parlor, like a nude rub and tug, and I was absolutely in love with it. They'd spent like $2 million in renovations. It was the most beautiful building I'd ever been in my entire life. And that it, yeah, that's where I began. I started as a receptionist.
So I'm here in the outback of New South Wales to meet with Holly and Carmen, who are sex workers that own a farm here and have been doing their work for 20 some odd years all over the world. I feel they'll have extremely unique perspectives on relationships and love, being the people someone goes to when they feel lonely, when they feel something's missing and they just need human touch and affection. And these cold nights will bring the importance of, of touch. We all need it as human beings, don't we? We all need company, we all need our own kind. We all need conversation, we need communication. We need to be listened to. Okay, so like for example, we, we use goats. Uh, animals in general, a pack animal or an animal that's in a herd, is that they will actually die of loneliness. That is a true story. You can't just have one goat. You can't just have one horse, hence why I've got so many. Um, but like they will literally die of loneliness. We just, it's inbuilt in us, we need it. I always wanted to get married. I always saw myself getting married with children. Like that was my big plan. And then, I, you know, I've, after a few years, I was kind of like, well, I just dated a lot of shit per, like people. I didn't want to get married to them. And as I've gotten older now, I'm kind of like, well, I'm getting too old to have kids. So yeah, I look, I, I love love. I hope I fall in love again one day. Like I think the last time I was in love was, I don't even know how long now. It's been a while. I'm not against it, but yeah. I don't know. We'll see what happens in the future. We'll see what happens. But look, you know, I'm very honest about who I am and anyone that's gonna, you know, date me or wanna be with me, then they'll have to know my whole past. And a lot of people aren't comfortable with that, but I've been really lucky that the people I've had in my life all know about it and they're fine with it. And I guess it doesn't define me as a person, even though I always will in my heart be a whore, like I'll always identify as a whore. Um, but yeah, I'd love one day, look, I'm not, not opposed, yes. What kind of men hire you? Um, really, this is, there is no certain one type. I think that there's a common theme along the situations that they're in when, when they would want someone like me. Nine times out of 10 uh, is, is really not someone that's attached, to be honest with you. Um, they might, as, a, as many, they might come from a divorce, um, be hard yakka being a farmer's wife, I'm telling you that right now. So, uh, especially during drought and all of the variables that we have around here. So it might have come from a divorce. Um, one that gets me in the feels is that, you know, uh, for some of them, their wife might have passed away. So, oh, don't let me start crying. Yeah. I'm too <laughs> Is that common or? Um, <clears throat> can be. Thank you, babes, loves you. Uh, uh. Oh, man. My mess? Yes, I'm a mess. Oh, <laughs> you look great. sort it out. <laughs> um, yeah, all right. Okay. Whew. All right, so, um, yeah, like, so for example, um, maybe, yeah, their life partner um, has, has might have passed away for whatever reason, and that that's a bum deal. That is a really bum deal when you've um, when you when you've been committed to someone and you've got that you know going somewhere in life and all that sort of thing, and then then your your partner passes away. Couldn't ever imagine it. Breaks my heart to think about it. I could never imagine that. So what are those people meant to do afterwards? You know, they've raised kids. They've been with their you know their wife for maybe all. 30 years or something like that and then you know the cancer comes and gets her and, and what do you I don't know yeah look it is different types of love but for a brief moment I think sometimes when it is a sexual thing you can you feel wanted you feel you feel you know attractive it's it's not love but it sort of gives you that same temporary feeling of love it's just not forever it's just not, not forever, forever. Researchers have found loneliness can be just as lethal as smoking 25 cigarettes a day, with lonely people being twice as likely to die prematurely than those who have healthy social relationships. Private escort work, 
It is more companionship. It is, you know, having someone to listen to you. Um, you know, a lot of my bookings when I was working, it would be just us lying naked in a bed, me stroking their body and them just telling me about their week or what's going on in their brain or what's, you know, the drama. And that is like, they just want that intimacy, that companionship, that's just to feel important, you know, to be listened to, yeah. However, there is a far darker side to sex work or prostitution for the vast majority of women who participate in it. Carmen and Holly in the Outback are unfortunately the outliers. In truth, 90% of sex workers would leave the industry if given the opportunity. A cursory viewing of channels like Soft White Underbelly, who regularly interviews prostitutes, will show you an industry where rape, beatings, and murder are seen as part and parcel of that world. There are always exceptions to the rule, but unfortunately, the selling of sex often results in what most traditional narratives tell us is a sacred act being reduced down to nothing more than a commodity. I think that's, you've hit it on the head, it is less sacred. And now because of, you know, every second person's got OnlyFans and, you know, selling their shit online. And I think it's, yeah, it's taken away that, like I say, yeah, sacred, it's sacredness of it. There's what, what's left, you know, like if you've done everything, what is there to strive to or to hope for or, yeah, I don't know. Do you come up with good, some good questions here? I'm like, fucking hell. While prostitution has existed since time immemorial, the mass consumption of pornography is a much more recent phenomenon. The negative effects of pornography are manifold. Just like traditional drugs, pornography creates escalating behaviors through desensitization. Teenagers who watch porn are far more likely to believe that dangerous sex acts are more normal than their peers. A lot of people have talked about this, that pornography can kind of promote unrealistic standards for bodies and for sexual acts as well. So a lot of women have reported feeling insecure about their body from, from pornography. Uh, men as well, feeling insecure about their own body, particularly, you know, the size of their member and that sort of a thing. And then people may also feel pressured to engage in sexual acts, learn from pornography that they're not comfortable with. This is another trend that's kind of emerged, is that uh, people are expected perhaps to engage in, in more aggressive or violent sexual behaviors, things like that, fetishes that may not have been something they were interested in, but perhaps feel pressured by a partner who learned that earlier in life from porn or something like that. Once again, it can be easy to judge men who consume porn and hire prostitutes, as well as the women who partake in this profession. But the reality is, it's growing across the board for a reason. Desperation for intimacy, or some form of it. Even future trends, what are we seeing? Kind of this rise in artificial intelligence girlfriends. People are forming parasocial relationships with chatbots online, so not directly pornography, but closely, closely related to that. While the company of a stranger is only a temporary solution, simply the impact of human touch itself can improve an individual's psychological well-being, reduce feelings of loneliness, and even fight off infections. Given this, instead of judging what people do in their pain and loneliness, perhaps we should find ways to fix that pain and loneliness. Yes, definitely. I, I'm, I'm super lonely, I'm, but I don't, I'm kind of, it's kind of feels comfortable being lonely. So it's a kind of weird feeling. I think it's like uh, people just get used to it. Um, or for me, I'm, I, I don't mind being lonely, but I know a lot of people are lonely. That's why they're on the dating apps these days. I think it's made dating feel very disposable. People can come and go, you basically got a catalog where you can just flick through, oh, I didn't like her hairstyle. Oh, she said something annoying on that date. Bum, 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 on to the next. When people get scared about being by themselves, like they tend to run away from that and I guess seek different people and seek validation through interactions with other people. But um, if you just kind of learn to sit with yourself and kind of confront why you're afraid or why does this make me uncomfortable, like you find, I think, a lot more peace of mind and you feel like you don't have to do it as much. That's what I found for myself at least. Like I still get lonely, obviously, I still think about it, but it's not an overwhelming kind of crushing thing where I have to get onto an app and be like, oh, who's liked me, who, you know, it's, no, I, I do think people are lonely as a whole, yeah. One of the largest ways that the world has changed in the introduction of easy love is online dating and paralysis of choice. You know, in the past, we used to meet our mate in only one of three ways. Our family and friends made an introduction, we met them at work, 
or in the normal course of our life, somewhere local, church or at the grocery store. But with uh, technology, we've been introduced to a whole pool of candidates that we never would have met otherwise. It took te technology to broaden our circles, for example. But that technology also brought other things. It brought a lot of choices and it brought instant gratification. That's not been good for human relationships because now we've become very picky, maybe unrealistically picky. The same way as having too many choices on a menu, well, you become indecisive. I don't know what to choose. So actually having more choices allows people to be more picky, more selective, and you think that would be a good thing where people develop standards and preferences. But when taken to the extreme, it actually paralyzes people in making choices. And also they're expecting to find the perfect mate right away. And so let's face it, there is no perfect mate. That's part of what goes into a healthy, committed, long-term relationship. The ability to adapt, to accommodate, to basically compromise. Well, that's gone away. Now people expect perfection and they expect it immediately. And now with technology, you're not even face to face with somebody. You have a natural wall, a barrier, basically a mask. And that's allowed us to treat other people in a more cold and callous way. So our social skills have also declined. We're not even diplomatic about how we disconnect from people. Hence the term ghosting. You've heard of ghosting. Well, that's not polite. It wouldn't be polite in a bar. It's not polite over a phone or a laptop. It seems our liberation has in some ways made us less free. It may seem easy to blame these apps for our problems finding commitment, but the truth is technology is only an extension of our own human behavior. It amplifies our good as well as our bad. It amplifies our good as well as our bad. It's kind of sad, actually. Dating apps, I think, as a general rule, are kind of sad. <laughs> that sucks to say, doesn't it? it? Makes me a bit, makes me a bit like, oh, rough. <laughs> There's a saying, right? Being an old school romantic in a hookup culture is a special kind of hell. And I think that, like, that is a thousand percent the thing. Is I think that a lot of men, at least in my experience, they want to go the extra mile, but they're too scared to. So instead, they just cycle through as many women as they can which is annoying. Hookup culture is so scary. You guys have got to slow down with just mentally beating the heck out of each other. You know, scary, scary. I don't want to be a part of that world. It's people are too nasty to each other. People have no consideration for each other anymore. None. I mean, it's true. We put so much emphasis on our feelings and on, you know, um, expressing them and crying and, you know, being aware of our mental health and of being, being aware of, you know, being mentally healthy and all these sort of things. And yet, by the same token, we encourage this weird hookup culture where we basically discredit and throw away how other people feel and we call them babies or we call them, you know, we, we attack people personally when they want more or when they don't behave in a certain way or whatever the case may be. And I think that, honestly, just watching it like begrudgingly wishing that, you know, hoping to find the right person, but you know, watching it from the outside, I often just, I think, oh my God, we're doing this to ourselves. We celebrate in this culture, this idea of casual sex, this idea of the hookup culture. It is no longer even um, questions. It's just accepted. That's just what it is. So women are engaging in this with no understanding of the fact that they come away from that experience damaged. I think the hookup culture has been very destructive for women who've fe felt that um, they were under pressure to, to treat it like a game of squash, to you know, go in there as if it was just about sexual enjoyment. The fact is that women have oxytocin, high levels of oxytocin that men don't have, and it causes them to attach and to bond to the man with whom they're, they're um, having sex. And so the idea of casual sex just doesn't even work from a biological perspective. And that's very surprising for women because they were taught, again, that they're just like men. I do think the young generation now almost always goes to bed too quickly. And if they go to bed with each other, the women are much more likely to see it as a sign that this is going to lead on to something wonderful. So the women get even more excited. And then as the man realizes, 
no, this is not the right person for me, and extracts himself. I mean, he knows he's inflicting an enormous one on hurt on her because her expectations are different. Men and women struggle with this stuff. The fact that men are capable of separating, not that we should be arguing that that's a good thing, but just the biological facts is that they're capable of separating, is the reason why the film, He's Just Not That Into You, um, wasn't called She's Just Not That Into You, right? Like people understand that sex is different for men than it, than it is for women. So that is one thing that is just not told to women whatsoever. So they're very surprised at their reactions when they are trying to engage in this crazy idea of, of, of hooking up. The fact is when people have sexual relationships, it unleashes all sorts of brain chemistry and psychological forms of attachment. And so people are having more than sex. They actually are going through, at least psychologically and biologically, the early stages of forming a relationship. And so if people start now messing with that natural biology and natural psychology, people may not even realize when they have met the right one, when they don't even realize the signs or the feelings, the hints that people have internally of, wow, this is more than just a hookup. I really like this person. This might be the foundation for a long-term relationship. Again, the outcome has been too much sex can blind a person to the markers and the indicators of love. A lot of this has led to a fiery debate online called the body count discourse. If you have a high body count, you're not even an option anymore. So even you know that a woman what? that has a past is no longer valuable, which is why you're hesitant to answer the question. What we know from the research is men, when they see another man with you know a high body count, they tend to view it very positively as, as a sort of status signal. In fact, it's a very, very robust status, status signal. Men see a man who you know had many partners or who claims to, and they think, this is a high status man. Look at all of the mates he can acquire. Women don't. When women see a man with a high body count, they view him negatively as negatively as men view women who have a high body count. So it's pretty same. What does that signal to women, for example? Low trust, low commitment, a high potential for infidelity, and also disgust sensitivity comes into it as well, right? Fear of pathogens, the idea that, ah, someone that has had many partners, you know, could be a risk because they have a disease, for example. So it's probably the case there, you know, that for a man, they want to be someone that maybe could have had sex with a, a lot of women, have access to a lot of women, but who actually has not. It's undeniable that hookup culture is viewed with negativity for a reason. But despite much commentary online, those who have been swept up by modern romance trends should not lose hope for their future, so long as they're willing to seek out and heal with partners sharing similar pasts to their own. So in my own data, I asked how many men and women know uh, the current body count of your partner, basically, right? How many past sexual partners have they had? 30% of men didn't know at all. For a committed romantic relationship, 25% of women didn't know. I also asked men and women, do you ask your romantic partner in a relationship? 50% of men, they don't ask. 42% of women, they don't ask. So this could be because they don't want to know or they don't want to care. If they knew, maybe it would bother them or maybe they really just genuinely don't care. But if you have half of the population saying they don't ask, then it's probably not the case that this is going to come up. And then at the same time, we have a sortative mating, right? That individuals who are more promiscuous tend to pair up with others who are more promiscuous as well. Often, you know, those might be the individuals that care less. So it's, you know, they're gonna find each other. It's probably not the case that this is going to exclude a lot of people from, from the mating pool. In fact, while high body count does have correlations with lack of ability to maintain relationships, Extreme bitterness towards those who have engaged in hookup culture also has a correlation with inability to even form or partake in sexual relationships in the first place. Why might people put so much effort into trying to convince the world that people with high body counts are not going to find love? Part of this could be intersexual competition, right? And there's a lot of research that indicates men who are less successful in the mating market develop more negative attitudes toward promiscuity. Uh, there's been experiments as well along those lines that manipulating uh, dating apps in an experimental condition to make men get rejected more, you give them a measurement for attitudes toward promiscuity after the fact, and it becomes more negative, even acutely, very, very fast. So people shift their belief on that very, very quickly. Uh, we see uh, competition that comes into it as well. When men are in, a, in an environment with a 
male heavy sex ratio. They also become more negative towards promiscuity. And when men are subjected to photos of men who look more masculine or, or who, who have beards, for example, they also become more negative toward promiscuity. So the idea of competition, of low success in the mating market and all of that. And yeah, so something that I found in my data as well is men who were young, who were not in school, who were not employed and who were virgins themselves had the most negative attitudes toward high body counts. They were the ones that wanted a virgin the most. So that's kind of what you see is it's probably intersexual competition. People are trying to shame others, you know, maybe to uh, make mates more available for themselves in a sense. This highlights one of the greatest problems with our discourse around the romance crisis. Increasingly, advice is rarely coming from a place of genuine care, whether it be mocking of virgins or shaming of the promiscuous. At the extremes, you see a deep bitterness and desire for others to be in more unfortunate circumstances than our own, a perpetual race to the bottom. One solution to many of these problems would be, rather than shame, to promote healthy relationships, like strengthening families. But even something as simple and obviously good as the family unit has found itself a victim of extremist politics. It's a very strange paradox that the more sexualized the culture has become, in a way the less vital and vigorous true sexual relations have become. I think the sexual revolution, like all revolutions, may have started off with great uh, ideals, but it's actually consumed its own. Um, if you look at Kate Millett uh, and all her Marxist friends from the 60s who founded the National Organization of Women, this great standard bearer of the sexual revolution. Their objective was actually destructive. It was to tear down the patriarchy, and that meant destroying marriage. Politically, you're just dealing with plain and simple Marxism versus capitalism, right? At the end of the day, you depend on the state. In order to depend on the state, you've got to break down the family. In order to break down the family, you've got to break down marriage. In order to break down marriage, you've got to break down the relationship between women and men. And they said, we will achieve this by, quote, promoting promiscuity, eroticism, prostitution, and homosexuality, end quote. And you've got to ask yourself, how has that worked out for women? Because if you promote prostitution and eroticism, which means pornography, you've really established a new slave trade in vulnerable women to serve a male market. And if you promote promiscuity, which goes with the abortion culture. It's women who bear the price of that, not men. Um, it's women who have a place of death created in their body where there should be a place of life. And that messes with their minds and their hearts. This idea that men and women are equal really means that they're the same, that they're interchangeable, that it doesn't mean anything to be man or woman, when of course it, it, it means everything. So yeah, it's about, it's about breaking down the family and making people dependent on the state. And of course, that's that's a bigger issue that I don't think when you're talking about young people in love that they really care too much about that or they're not going to associate it really with, with what's going on. Uh, George Orwell said of the communist revolution, he said, there is something fundamentally wrong with a system that needs to be built on a mountain of corpses, end quote. The thing is that the sexual revolution is built on a much bigger mountain of tiny corpses. The abortion on demand is the essential guarantee of the sexual revolution. It's the essential guarantee of that uh, ancient fantasy of the predatory male, that he can have sex without consequence. And the strange thing is that this is claimed to be a victory for feminism. Once again, the revolution eats itself by liberating the worst impulses of feral men. I would say that feminism has allowed men to play out their selfish desires in the sense that if guys don't want to commit to you and they don't want to have a relationship with you and they don't want to be serious with you, 
they can just have sex with you and never talk to you again. If that is something that they are interested in doing, that is completely justified because women and men can have sex in the same frequency now and it's perfectly fine. Which again, if that's how people wanna operate, that's completely their prerogative. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna say anything mean or nasty to them for doing that. But uh, yeah, no, for sure. It, it's made it easier for this, for people not to commit basically, which I think is really beneficial to uh, men specifically because obviously if they can have sex with a bunch of women, I think they'll do it. And if that's on the table and there's no ramifications when they do that, then they're probably gonna continue on doing that. I don't really believe in marriage because you don't need a piece of paper to tell you that you are in love and that you're committed. Uh, I'm a man of my word. So if I say I'm gonna love you forever, I'll probably love you for a few years and then change my mind. Weirdly enough, I'm more comfortable with the title of mother than I am of wife. <laughs> but that's again, a personal thing. I think long lasting love and creating a family is one of the most beautiful things that we can experience in our lives. Um, I, but I can't really imagine that right now because I haven't met the right person. You know, I'm in my 30s now and what I thought was gonna happen in my 20s didn't. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because I would much rather meet someone later and it be this amazing connection and be the right person and, and ideally we don't divorce. The biological clock can sound like a nasty word, but that doesn't make it any less real. Peak fertility for women is around their early to mid 20s. By age 30, one's fertility begins to rapidly decline. By age 45, your chances of getting pregnant are less than 4% per cycle. Just 30 years ago, the vast majority of women were giving birth in their early to mid 20s. The number of women now giving birth to their first child after 30 has risen by nearly 50%. And with it, infertility and challenges, with record numbers of women having to use the expensive and strenuous process of IVF to get pregnant, when their bodies will no longer do so naturally. Um, I'm calling with your results, and unfortunately, the test is negative. <laughs> And I feel like I should have started sooner. I should have, I should have done this. I should have done that. I shouldn't have blah, blah, blah. Like, right? You just go through all the scenarios. I feel like I've wasted my time and I've wasted my money. Until you're married and you have friends that are married trying to have kids, you do not realize how challenging of a process IVF is, how expensive it is. And I feel like so many women are, have been given the short end of the stick by being lied to by these magazines and media that just, you know, put your career first. And that's fine if a woman wants a career, but you put it first and then you really wanted kids. But we didn't know, we didn't know. I mean, all the mothers who said to their daughters, you know, it's fine, you have your career. I mean, that came from a lot of mums too, who felt they missed, I mean, my, my mother is classic who never achieved what she wanted to because she was a mum and because she followed my father out from, they came from, from Germany. Um, and, you know, he ended up with, he, had a, he was a famous economist and he had an illustrious career and my mother, his career was really compromised as a result of that. She, I mean, there was a whole generation of women like that who said to their daughters, you know, get get educated, get a girl. I mean, we, they didn't know that the, the, the fertility problem was going to be as bad as it turned out to be. Uh, but we know now, so why aren't we talking more about that? Uh, I do think in a way we have been lied to, but I mean, I, I think that women, I think women want to have the best of both worlds and I don't see that anything wrong with that. What I think is problematic is that, um, we're just not told that, yeah, sometimes you do get to a point where you have sort of run out of time. Sadly, difficulties with natural conception is not the only downside of giving birth later. The chances of life-threatening ectopic pregnancies can be up to eight times higher in women over 35. It's the women who have babies. It's the women who get pregnant, not the men. So they have a certain amount of time in which to get their life in order that men don't. You know, and that's, that's just the way it is. We're never gonna be able to change that. So the idea is, the smart idea is to work within what you've got. And nobody wants to say that to women because the idea is that they're supposed to be living parallel lives throughout their life as similar to men's. And that's why they end up in a 
pickle when they hit about the age of 30 and realize, wait, this isn't, this isn't working so well. A, a perception, uh, particularly in the manosphere, that men can just go ahead and date uh, much younger women and that that's kind of going to solve the problem. You know, what I would say to that, uh, to those individuals, is good luck. And despite popular belief, men also experience reduced fertility with age, with sperm quality drastically decreasing after 40. Children with fathers aged 40 or over are five times more likely to develop autism spectrum disorder than children to fathers under 30. The myth of eternal male fertility is just that, a myth. Some men believe they can escape the consequences of the passage of time by easily and simply finding women much younger than them to bear their children. Most of them are sorely mistaken. We see that women express very strong preferences for men who are close to their own age, within a window of two to four years. That's kind of the ideal. So it's not the case, particularly very young women, you know, that are going to be wanting to date men in their mid to late 30s in that sense. There's some of that discourse that, you know, that's when um, male value is, a, is at its peak. It's really not, you know, and particularly people show a strong, or I should say women in especially show a, show a very strong preference for men kind of close to their own age. The idea that any of us, male or female, can just wait forever to have children is only a recent and extremely flawed notion, and not just in its blindness to biology. Age is a factor if you want to be a parent that can run around with your child kicking a soccer ball when they reach their teens. Age matters if we consider the burden we may be to our children during their prime years as we begin to hit our last. Age matters when we consider whether we want to meet and care for our grandchildren one day. This path of frivolous pleasure seeking has resulted in deep pain for many. So where do we go next? Well, some have suggested we go back to a time before the revolution. Tradition is often portrayed as old dated practices, a certain shirt you have to wear on Sunday or the reciting of a sacred text, but this is simply a superficial side to it. In reality, tradition is built up of knowledge from our ancestors through the ages, what they did wrong, what they did right. All of them have passed down little bits of advice after their long and complicated lives. We only have so much time to make mistakes, just one life, and so we compile a guidebook for those who come next. I think the old rules made it easier for men and women to, to be kind to each other. I mean, because when, you know, the whole, when, I was, when I was a teenager, there were still very strict rules about how far you let the boy go, you know, and most women complied with that. Uh, 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 you know, that was just before everything started to totally disintegrate, I suppose. And, and men know, knew what, how nice girls behaved. I mean, there were very strict ideas about appropriate behaviour. Now it's, no one knows, and I think it's become enormously much more difficult um, to protect ourselves and to protect each other and behave, behave kindly towards each other. Well, tradition is something that's been proven over time. It, it matches our human nature. And I love um, thinking of the really old word for marriage, which was matrimony. So matrimony was a word that comes from two Latin words, mater meaning mother, and monium meaning state or condition. So the word tells us that this institution of matrimony or marriage is built around the condition or possibility of motherhood. It's all about the mother and child phenomenon in nature and reinforcing that in a family. And against that tradition, I'd say that people who, who seek cheap imitations, well, no wonder it leaves them empty. Because I'm now, of course, not only a mother, but a grandmother, I now put more emphasis on the children and bound up with the sexual Revolution was an idea about, you know, if you're not happy in a marriage, you move on. You know, that was part of this whole argument about looking after yourself in the me generation was, if you're not sexually and emotionally content in your relationships, you're, you're better off with a good divorce and a bad marriage. And, and I, that's where I've, I've revised my opinion, that I think I knew nothing about children and it wasn't part of the equation I was, when I was discussing encouraging people to get out there and enjoy their sexuality. 
I now feel we were too casual about relationships and the impact of the break, particularly the breakup of relationships on children. That's where my biggest reservations have come from because we then saw a huge shift in attitudes towards stability of marriage and that's been very destructive for our society. In the post-sexual revolution world where a lot of people have experienced some degree of casual sex, right? It's not the case that most people are virgins when they get married. Most people have had multiple relationships, at least multiple sexual partners. Are we going to be able to have kind of this return to tradition where, where everyone's going to go back to this extreme chastity and lifelong monogamy? It doesn't seem to be the case. And as far as people living out their you know, lives, which are relatively short, we have you know, a pretty short window to find a mate, to fall in love, kind of live a life with someone else, uh, spending a lot of time trying to change the whole society and culture, it seems relatively fruitless, especially if it's kind of really kind of a, an expressed mating strategy, you know. I think people do kind of need to uh, give a little grace in that sense, a little bit of compromise for, for the opposite sex and for whatever, you know, kind of their, their past sexual behavior may be. Not even just in, in an idealistic or moral sense, but in a very, very pragmatic sense. Because if you're a man and you make it to age 28, you know, and you're still like hung up over wanting a virgin or something, you're not going to find a virgin at that age. It's going to be extremely, extremely difficult. So there has to be some uh, realism there, some kind of compromise that this is the world we live in. And, you know, you can encourage values uh, uh, more, you know, chastity in a sense. But as far as your actual mating behavior and selecting a mate and finding a partner, yeah, you're going to have to compromise with the fact that, you know, they've had past partners before in most cases. While some traditions have been destructive and oppressive and demanded to be challenged, it's undeniable there's an inherent human desire for structure and order, lest we be enslaved by our own confusion in a shallow liberation. But recreating that structure has proven more difficult than some may think, especially in an age where many young people didn't grow up with it modeled for them. As a result, you've seen a cartoonish version of this structure reappear in what is called the modern trad movement. In one part, it's kind of a reaction to uh, feminism, modernity as well. So people see something in the past that's often kind of an idealized past, uh, often disconnected perhaps from many of the realities of the way that it was, but. Uh, very driven by aesthetics and images, so a very idealized, simple, traditional life in many cases. So, there is that where they view it positively, but then for some individuals it's also essentially a cope, right? And related kind of to relationships and mating frustrations. They think that perhaps a more traditional environment, perhaps uh, something where relationships were almost mandatory in a sense, or as they perceive it, given to them, even arranged marriages, for example, will make it essentially easier for them to mate. And that can be kind of related to a perceived loss of power in individual men, maybe also kind of a loss of traditional roles that they think that they would like. It could also be, you know, that there, there does seem to be some dissatisfaction within interpersonal relationships as far as uh, egalitarianism. People do seem to kind of like these roles to some extent. I guess one thing to remember on that is that it wasn't always easy, you know, to get a wife. We think of, you know, the trads, often the imagery comes from the 1950s when there was a very high marital rate, but that wasn't always the case for the past three or 400 years. You see, you know, 30% of men being unmarried, for example, through 1700, 1900, and this depends on the area because Victorian era, it had more, but uh, it wasn't always easy to get a mate. You know, there were high rates of premarital pregnancy, perhaps an earlier period was not always quite as trad or as easy, you know, as, as uh, people seem to think that it might have been. In reality, relationships have been hard work throughout the ages. Rarely are there simple solutions to societal crises, especially when too often said solutions are not coming from real human advice from older generations, but rather snapshots of the past missing all necessary context. I think that this perception that relationships in previous times may have been less degenerate or easier or something. I think a lot of it comes from advertisements actually, kind of idealized pictures. If you see kind of the aesthetics that come up in this trad movement, very often it will be taken from uh, photographs from advertisements and it kind of depicts that lifestyle. It's kind of like if you go to someone's social media today and they put all of their best pictures and they kind of create a fanciful image of themselves. I think a lot of people don't look into how things may have been for the average individual and I think also 
certain virtues of different time periods kind of bleed together. So people might look at the 1950s and say, high rate of marriage. You know, they might not look at 1700 and see, you know, uh, very high premarital pregnancy, for example, and, and kind of just combine like the past was better when it was very varied in the past. Our memoricide around the history of relationships and sex, how difficult they have always been, and also the discarding of some necessary guardrails of tradition from older generations has caused great confusion and consequence in the real world. The easy dehumanization of other genders, feeling like sex is the only thing that matters, the disregarding of people's emotions and humanity and mental health, having no standards whatsoever. All of this is leading to the indication that we as a culture are not taking relationships and sex serious enough and not considering the impacts it has on us. While perhaps we needed a sexual revolution, all of the societal data is telling us our current approaches are not working. But is there anything that can realistically be done about this all? Perhaps not on a societal level, but we always have dominion over our own personal approach. To date, far too many important conversations regarding fertility and sex are all coming out of malice, telling women they no longer have value due to their age, men that they are too short, too poor, or worthless incels who will never find love, telling those who have engaged in hookup culture that there is no forgiveness or healing, that they'll never find love, eternal finger pointing and hoping the other is more miserable. Anyone doing that is digging not only their own grave, but a civilizational grave. Everyone knows the problems that exist with the world today, and yet the vast majority still partake in it to various extents, including a significant portion of those who rail against its impacts online. So to simply write off the entire world right now as broken, unfixable, and unredeemable is no solution at all. Too many people who say that we should hate the sin and love the sinner are inside still hating on the person doing what they perceive as a negative action. The path forward, no matter what form that takes, must primarily be rooted in deep compassion for our fellow human beings. Any solution not based on love is truly empty. Love means willing the good of the other. It is a cool, calm, dry act of the will. Now, if it has a whole lot of emotional colouring and, and uh, passion coming in on top of that, that's really good. What does love mean to me? Are you really asking me this question? Laura, no. Are you being serious? Do I really? <laughs> People need to know that they are going to be with somebody that takes their needs into account, not just looking for someone to provide them what they want. People kind of need to look inward instead of pointing fingers, I think. I suppose love from my perspective would be ending up with someone that I want to spend the rest of my life with, or I guess in Sydney Watson terminology, annoy for the rest of my life. I will say, I, I do feel sorry for women in a way as well too, because we've, all of us, have been thrown in the spanner with what do we do with our lives. Yeah. You know, some women that may have wanted to be housewives and uh, just have kids or whatever we want to do, we... It's frowned upon now. It's frowned upon it, That's the, you're not for using, you're using your potential. I would love to be married and have kids and be a stay-at-home mom. I would love that. If my husband worked for me, I would have, when he came home from work, there'd be a beer on the table, his meal would be cooked. I'd be wearing lingerie if he wanted, you know what I mean? Like if someone was gonna go out there and work so I didn't have to, fuck yeah, I, man, I would do whatever for them. Yes, I would treat them like a king. I don't think women should, I don't think women need to be scared about their biological clock. I think they need to be aware of it and just work with it. Just work with it, work with what you got. It's not difficult, but it is difficult if you were kept in the dark about it. Reject modern feminism would be where I start. I, mean, I think feminism is doing nothing for relations between men and women. You. Can you tell me about your last Tinder date? My last Tinder date was a very long time ago. She was a, a soft-spoken woman, Armenian. 
It was the late 2010s. Me and her shared a bath together. It was a glorious time. We made love for hours. She left in a rush in the morning, went back to her country of Armenia. I never saw her again. I'm so sorry. That's okay. It was, it was my first love and my only love and I'll never love again. Thank you for asking me that. It brought back good memories. Thank you. Phil, yes. what does love mean to you? Love means sharing a bubble bath with a stranger for one magical evening and never to be seen again. Love is the feeling you share for all these people around you. Regardless of clothing, regardless of whether or not you can see or feel, you just love deeply. All right, well, I hope you all enjoy your orgy no, 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 tonight. No, no, no. What does love <laughs> mean to you, Lauren? What does, what love, does love mean to me? Yes. Commitment. Ah, that's something we don't have in common. <laughs> Thank you.